And, you know, it's like when we go back to archery, when you get a step up to the line, you know, if, if you step up to the line going, oh, and I hear this all the time from, especially the, the young kids, well, I wonder how I'm going to shoot today. I probably miss. I'll probably, you know, I probably won't even hit the target. And they and they're telling themselves all this negative, nasty stuff. I heard it on the pro line like three times yeah. a day. <laughs> and it's no wonder they miss, right. because you've just told yourself this is what I want. Well, it's probably going to happen. For those of you who are not quote unquote Christians, mm-hmm. which the word means Christ like, and mm-hmm. you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm far from Christ like. So to call me a Christian, like I cringed a little bit at that word because <laughs> I don't think I could take the kind of beating that guy did for us. <laughs> You go down there, and that's a solid 10. And you're going, how did that <laughs> happen? Like, oh, and, you know, and, and it make it would make the, the worst person in the world religious because, oh, thank you, God. <laughs> thank you, God, that I didn't drop that 10. Hey, everyone. This is Rod White, and you're either listening to or watching The Rod White Bow Show. Welcome to the Rod White Bow Show. I'm sitting here with a really good friend and old friend, Randy Morocco, uh, who grew up in Pennsylvania yeah. with me. And um, weird story. So Randy uh, is a pastor. Mm-hmm. I'm going to let you tell him, you tell them the story. But for me, one thing that was kind of weird for me is I went through a big, long transition in my life and where I was led to Christ. And I still mess up constantly, which well, is kind of the foundation of everything, I guess. So good for me. <laughs> yeah. But um, that that travel through there um, was interesting because I remember watching you shoot, and I looked up to you a lot, and you never really talked to me much, um, a little bit, but mm-hmm. we weren't like best buddies by any means. You shot, we shot at a club called Golden Grain Archery, mm-hmm. and uh, I'd go in and shoot every day, almost, till my arms fell off, or my parents made me go home, or sometimes even slept overnight in the shop. True story. Um, and Randy would come in and shoot in leagues, and we had a couple bow hunter leagues, and then we had a target league, and we had Joe Ad, Junior Olympic Archery Development, a kids league. We had a couple league, couples league on Sunday. Mm-hmm. But Randy was always there shooting on one of those league nights, and I didn't really know Randy, but Randy just, for some reason, I'm like, oh, guy's really cool, even though he didn't talk much. Mm-hmm. And um, so later, and we'll go through this here in just a minute, but Later on, when I reconnected with you, after coming back to the sport, after being gone for like 12 years, um, maybe more, uh, I found out you were a Christian, and not just a Christian, a pastor. Mm -hmm. And so for me, that was like, wow. And then I started asking you, you probably remember, I started like, how long have you been a Christian or a pastor? Right. Because I'm, you know, still pretty young at it. And uh, so whenever I started, you know, asking more questions, more questions, I thought, wow. You know, like sometimes there are people put in your life whether you believe in God or not, they just are, and they're, they're putting your life, and they have an impact on you, and sometimes you don't really recognize it until mm-hmm. later on, so it's pretty cool. But Absolutely. So, to start off with shooting, we're both here at Vegas, and um, we're both, unfortunately, not in, in the, the shoot-offs. Shoot <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. Um, we'll get there, maybe next year. Um, Randy, whenever I, I left Pennsylvania and moved to Iowa... I, I can't remember, honestly, and you can smack me silly, but I don't remember you just shooting, like, lights out scores. I remember mm-hmm. you working hard, but now all of a sudden when I come back and see you again, you're at a pro level, and there was a huge progression. So I'm going to start with that. Like, how did you get from where you were then, when I knew you, to where you are now? Well, you know, the, the, the progress was, it, it was just a process. And, um, you know, when, when we shot together back in Golden Grain. I think I've, I'm seven years older or so than you are. But that puts, I think you were 14 and I would have been at 21. And so I, I saw you in, 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 in that sort of role. There's a 14 year old kid that's shooting really, really good. And, uh, but I was married and started having kids, kids of my own. Um, and, and I've always enjoyed shooting as a matter of fact, when, uh, when I was seven years old, uh, my brother went and got a little red bear recurve and began to shoot it. And I really picked it up and I, I just enjoyed the, the arc of that arrow. And so we would uh, go hunting together and eventually, you know, archery really stuck with me. He kind of left it and went on with guns and things like that. But 
the the archery part always kind of stuck with me and i remember saving up my my pennies to buy this uh, 1978 browning nomad 2 and had a wood riser wood limbs and it had the, the the these you know modern cams on it and i remember as you know a 12 13 14 year old kid in in, in the backyard of my home uh shooting with 2018 arrows and a finger tab into the into hay bale we hay bales that we got off at the farmers and, and locally and uh just absolutely in love with the sport of archery you know and, and as time went on uh you know eventually uh, I, I did get married and started having kids and and just you know started shooting 3ds and and was doing pretty well at it but just the, the the pull of family and jobs and other situations sort of sort of took me away from archery for for a while. Then when I was in my thirties, I uh, received a call from God and uh, started taking courses to get into the ministry. Well, you know, I've I've always still shooting was still there. I would shoot the leagues at Golden Grain, but other than that, it was leagues at Golden Grain or, or I'd go hunting. And when I was called into the ministry, it it took a lot of my time up. And so when uh, I basically put everything down and just uh, sold most of my equipment where I was sitting there collecting dust. And it wasn't too much longer. It was about three years after I got into the ministry, uh, right about 2007, where I decided that I miss shooting my bow. I really miss competing. I, I miss shooting the leagues. And, and I talked to my wife and I said, honey, I said, I, I, I want to get back into this. And uh, so I, I sold a couple things and I bought a, a 1995 Matthews Ovation and began to shoot it. And uh, I didn't know anything about bow tuning at the time. As a matter of fact, it, I, I, I would rather give a bow to somebody, please tune it for me and I'll shoot it. I don't want to mess with it. I don't want to know what my, you know. And, uh, and so finally I started learning about bow tuning. And, you know, at, and, and back then in 2007, you know, uh, websites like Archery Talk and other things started to come on and there were a lot of pros, you know, that were on there that would give out advice. And I would just click on it and read it and see what they had to say and, and oh, I'm doing that wrong. And I bought my first back tension release. I uh, learned how to shoot it correctly by just reading articles online. And uh, sooner, soon enough, I, I started shooting, my score started going up. And um, back in, uh, in 2007, uh, Danny Jackson and, and uh, Dave McCullough invited me to go to an a indoor archery tournament down in Pittsburgh. And I had never been to an archery tournament before in my life. I've been to league. I've never been to an archery tournament. And so I took my Matthews Ovation in it with my 2413s and blazers. And I don't know. The combination was, was totally geeked out because I didn't know what I was doing. I don't know what draw length it was. I really don't. And, uh, but I did know that I had to get that bow into tune when I did. And uh, so... We went down to the shoot and I shot my first 600 round, uh, 600 with like 51, 52 X's that night. And I remember those last three shots and my heart beating and, and pounding and, you know, getting to the last shot and shooting that and making that final shot, shooting that 600. And then the, 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 the people coming to you saying, that's that's great shooting. You did wonderful. You did awesome, and and sort of it, it really made me feel good that in archery I did something that other people had tried to do. They was aspired to do, but I finally got that six hundred underneath my belt, and it was just that that boost in confidence that it was I can do this. I had a slew of five ninety nines, five ninety eights. And uh, it, w it wasn't until then that I was like, well, I can actually do this. And then they started coming, you know, one after the other. And, and it became sort of a, if I didn't shoot a 600, I was bummed out. You know, 598, 599, which used to be like, yeah, now we're like, oh, what, you know, what a slug. You know what I'm saying? So, 
so so you know that that's sort of like the cliff notes of the, of the process it took. It just took a lot of years. It took a lot of dedication. I shot in my basement. We had I had ten yards in my basement, and I would just put dots on, on a target. And uh, I didn't you know going into the ministry at that time, we didn't have the the money to buy a, a morel target, and I just I took cardboard, stacked cardboard together, and took a ratchet strap and strapped that thing down yeah. and. And just shot arrows at ten yards, and trying to repeat the process over and over and over again. I, get the, I know my wife got sick of hearing thunk, thunk, thunk <laughs> in, in the basement. So, but yeah, the Cliff Notes version of that is is really it. Just took just a lot of dedication and a love to want to do that, and uh, I I loved it. In you know even if I didn't score high, I still love archery and I still love shooting and I still love getting out with people and meeting with people and uh and and making new friends and making lifelong friends in archery so well and for you actually it kind of it goes hand in hand with your job actually because you meet people that aren't believers and mm-hmm. you know w- w- there's a million labels for all of us out there um for those of you who are not quote unquote christians mm-hmm. which the word means christ-like and mm-hmm. you can correct me if i'm wrong but I'm far from Christ-like, so to call me a Christian, like, I cringed a little bit at that word, because <laughs> I don't think I could take the kind of beating that guy did for us. <laughs> I yeah. just, I mean, I'm pretty tough. My shoulder made it through some shots this week, I didn't yeah. think it would, but, but, um, people who believe in the fact that God came down from heaven in the form of man to save us, mm-hmm. um, from our own selves, because we're just evil, um, that... That gives you an opportunity, I'm sure at times, and I don't, you don't need to go into specific stories about people, or maybe you have or haven't really mm-hmm. affected people, but I can tell you for me, from my perspective, I, everything was taken away from me 100% completely, and that's why I disappeared off the face of the planet with archery. I, I still chase deer, but I disappeared completely, mm-hmm. and uh, it, it was, I, I went through a wicked divorce, and then, and I'm still dealing with that, my children are dealing with that, unfortunately, and then I've got... Uh, I married again, mm-hmm. and this time, and this is where it's kind of interesting, I guess, is um, we got married because we felt a lot of pressure from the church. I became a Christian. I, I got to the point where, a believer, I got to a point where I was broken, completely mm-hmm. 100% on the ground, broken, and I've been broken since that, but not to that kind of level. Right. For me, it took some, it took, it took a serious beating, <laughs> Taking away my my wife and my children, um, partly because of my own mistakes, partly because of other mistakes, and there's never one person to blame when something falls apart like that. Right. Um, and I just I remember thinking like, if, okay, now I can't figure out why I'm here. Mm-hmm. Why am I here? I don't I don't have any idea. And well, <laughs> now what do I do? I I met a guy who um, was really strong in faith and. It was on his basement floor that, you know, I just literally hit the ground. There are people that tell stories, and, and where I'm coming to from this is when I was at Matthews, Matthews, um, and, and many of you know, Matthews is, uh, I don't want to say a faith-based company, but kind um, sort of. Matt is very, very strong in his beliefs, mm-hmm. um, he is. and he wants to help others. I remember Matt uh, McPherson taking me to bookstore after bookstore, lunch after lunch, dinner after dinner, Thanksgiving dinners trying to get me to understand how important it was for me to grasp the concept of what someone had done for me one day that I didn't even really believe in. Right. And he planted the seed, Mm -hmm. I would say, and others did along the way. And then once I was completely broken, like completely broken, I got it. Mm -hmm. But in between there, I was told all I had to do was say a prayer. No, you say this prayer and you become a Christian. I'm like, oh, okay. All right, fine, Matt. I'll say the prayer. You bought me a million audio books because I wouldn't read the book and... Uh, okay, said it. Cool, I'm a Christian. But wait, a whole bunch of other people are telling stories about like leaves falling from trees. They see like <laughs> like these crazy things that happened to them, yeah. and there were angels that descended. Have that didn't happen to me. It's never yeah. happened to me. It didn't happen to me. Um, but it it's there's no doubt in my mind that there is a God, and He created everything that we have, and um, created us, and <laughs> even created us as evil creatures <laughs> that mess up all the time. Um, and in his likeness. So it's really weird to, to digest that. But I mean, I, I've looked at the options for me and in a crazy way, and I think I've shared this story with you before, there are some people's lives that literally, I, not like I ran to a burning building and grabbed somebody out, mm-hmm. but 
I talked to a guy who pretty much had a gun at his, to his head. He was going to shoot himself in the head and sit in the base of a cherry tree. He just, you know, messaged me out of the blue on Facebook one day. It's why, what? Tell me why I should live. In essence, mm-hmm. I'm like, what? And mm-hmm. I, I thought it was a joke. And you know, the more we kind of conversed back and forth on Facebook Messenger, I found it wasn't a joke. Mm-hmm. Um, and then later on, long story short, uh, there was, if I could say there was ever a time where God stepped into my life and grabbed me, it was then. Mm-hmm. And I pulled stuff out of the Bible that, wow, dude, I can't remember. Like, if you told me, hey, what's, you asked me, what's Philippians 14 and 3? I don't, I don't know. Yeah. Like, there's an Old Testament and a New Testament. I kind of know the stories. And, I, and I've and i listened to it a lot. I haven't read it much. <laughs> True story. But I just, um, I could, I, I, you, I could never recite any of that stuff. And I can't say like, oh, golden leaves fell down from trees, but that was the first time where I like I had an impact in someone's life, and mm-hmm. and I when I saw him and his wife a couple years later at a deer show, you know, it was pretty emotional. Like he, you know, there was no joke. He was gonna he was gonna shoot himself. And basically, the argument I used was, he didn't believe in God, and he's you know, why should I believe in your God? Well, okay, well first of all, it's like like my God, like I don't mm-hmm. know him, like <laughs> I'm crazy, um, but. What ha- what do you think happens to you if you pull the trigger today? Well, what do you mean? Like what happens to you? Like I'll mm-hmm. just die, cease to exist. Let's call it worm food. So you become worm food. Um, if you're right, you become you're right. You become worm food. You just cease to exist. You're fertilizer. If what I've told you about God coming to save you, and this may or may not, and I'm sure this is always an argument and contention. If if you kill yourself, that's one sin you can't repent from because you're. No, dead. Now, maybe you get up there and you can't, I don't know. But I'm going to roll with you can't. So if I'm right and you kill yourself, you're going to a place called hell, which none of us know what that really is. We just know it's really, really bad. And, like, there's <laughs> lots of stories. So, um, but, you know, I said, hey, if, if you're right, you know, you're still become warm food. If I'm right, you could go to heaven, which is another place we can't really describe, but we know it's better mm-hmm. than where we are right now. And that's what I believe in. And I believe in that book that's been around forever and ever. And yes, there's been modifications. So I'm not here to argue any of that with anybody. But um, faith was instilled in me early, even before Matt came along, was shooting mm-hmm. a bow and arrow. Mm-hmm. And as crazy as that sounds, it's um, not, again, not golden leaves falling from trees at all. I didn't even think about the word God ever. Probably said it a lot of times in a way I shouldn't have when I was mm-hmm. smashing stabilizers and throwing tantrums at the age of 14 <laughs> on the ground. But... Um, I did learn from my coach who I later found out was a Christian and kind of, he never pushed me, but he was always there to answer questions if I had them, uh, Tim Strickland. And he was, he was my Olympic coach and he, um, he watched me struggle at times with some things and he would casually mention it in a way that wasn't offensive to me whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And for me, you just, I can do things on my own. I was tough. I don't need anybody else. I can put me in a mountain, I'm going to go kill the biggest, baddest bull on here, and I'm going to go kill the biggest white tail on this farm, and I, I can do anything myself. I don't need anybody else. Mm-hmm. And then when everything's broken down, then, wow, yeah, I need somebody. Yeah. But that faith was was started to become a process with shooting a bow. Mm-hmm. And this is where I'm kind of trying to tie it into archery. So even if you don't believe in God, it's okay. Hopefully someday you will. But having faith in the process in which I learned from I learned completely different than everybody else. Uh, my coach taught me, Tim, um, I was fortunate enough that he taught me that no matter what, when you go into competition and you feel all those jitters and all mm-hmm. those that excitement, there are things that happen to you, whether you believe in God or not, that are put into you by either God or evolution, whatever you want to call it. Your pupils dilate. There is more oxygen being delivered to your blood. Um, there is more testosterone. And these are scientifically proven facts. Um, you can read about them in several, several books. Maybe I'll kind of look some up or something and put them in the notes, but those are things you can't control. And because you can't control that, if you didn't feel those things, what kind of fun would you have when you shot? Right. I'm like, what? Yeah, that's pretty cool. Cause that's what I do mm-hmm. like that. That's what I love. Mm-hmm. Not so much even getting up in front of crowds and hearing people cheer, which I love. Like that gives me so much energy, but because I feel like I'm shooting for them in a really weird way. That's for another podcast someday. But um, I, I just had faith in no matter what he told me to do, no matter what it was, I'm going to go up and I'm just going to do what he told me to do. Right. And the first international, men's international competition I went and shot, and I shot against a guy named Tommy Point Glanen, who was um, ranked, I think, number one in the world at the time. I was 14 years old, punk. And I walked, uh, before I walked up to shoot, I remember my coach saying, hey, 
But when you go up there, I want you to shoot your arrows all over the place, like all in the blue. And so if you don't know how target structure works in Olympic style, it's just like every other target sport, it's, you know, gold in the middle, then red, and then blue, and then black, and then white. And I'm like, like, you want me to intentionally suck? And he's like, yeah, just go up there and shoot them all over the place. Uh-huh. Okay. That's faith. I had to have that. Right. All right. So I walked up there and I shot my arrows all over the place. And the guy, Tommy, which he, I, you know, he doesn't speak really good English. Maybe he does now, and I hope he's watching somewhere. I think he was from Finland or something like that. But um, he, he was almost giggling mm-hmm. at me. Well, not almost. He was. And to his teammates, not speaking English. And I was like, whatever. You know, and I walk back and sit down. He's like, do it again. So I went up and did it again. We could get two practice wins. And we were ranked. Um, there was a cutoff. Everybody shot, and then we cut to the top 64 archers. One shot against 64, two against 63, and mm-hmm. so on. You worked your way through right. a single elimination bracket. And so um, when I went up to go shoot for score, I'm like, can I shoot him in the middle now? And he's mm-hmm. like, yes. Now you can aim at the middle of the target. <laughs> and so I just did. And my arrow, first arrow, it was a sunny day, and I'll never forget my first arrow. So I was like, whap, and hit right in the middle. I hit that little spider right in the middle of the target at 70 wow. meters. And I was like, sweet. And I looked over that guy's face, and he kind of like double looked, and he shot. And then I shot again and just wham, same mm-hmm. place. Wham, mm-hmm. same place. I shot all my arrows, and I think he had shot like two. And he was looking at my target, and he'd look back at me, and he'd look at my target, and he had just disbelief. And he was a better shooter than I was, but those those six just all went right in the middle of the target. And I won. I beat the guy. You know, there were a couple other ends that go along mm-hmm. with that, but it pretty much went the same. Right. Those shadows were sitting in the middle of the ten ring. That, that guy was looking at going, holy cow, like, this kid was just all over the blue, and I thought this was a cakewalk, and I'm number one in the world, and I just got beat by like a 14-year-old kid? I'm <laughs> sure that was what was going through his head. But um, getting back to what I'm trying to express is that that faith of knowing, not knowing I even had the ability to shoot like that, I just had to do what my coach told me to do. Right. And so now it's come kind of full circle where I've just beat my head against the wall with life i'm gonna do whatever i want to do and i'm just gonna keep doing what i want to do and things will work out because they always work out for me mm-hmm. and then like i said one day they didn't work out mm-hmm. and I'm totally out of my control so um that's how i was broken down and then um eventually got remarried again in a christian relationship i thought mm-hmm. and i got angered again because it didn't quite work out that way mm-hmm. we'll just leave it at that so <laughs> um I, it wasn't the perfect marriage like it was supposed to be we were pressured from the church we shouldn't have got married we were pressured from the church we did in fact i got kicked out of church which i'm sure you're like really thrilled to hear that but <laughs> i've never been kicked out of a bar i swear but i've been kicked out of a church and um and so i got kicked out of church and i was like sure we'll go to another church we went to another church and that guy said well i'm not going to marry you guys if you're living together too and i'm like all right listen we're, we're not having sex and this the whole premarital thing we're, we're doing things the way we need to mm-hmm. But we are living together because of the circumstances with the kids, and they just wouldn't marry us. Wow. And so we got married, and then things went south fast. Mm -hmm. Um, And before you know, second divorce. Right. So, um, again, you know, there are ways, I guess, that, like, you can feel defeated, even though you're not on the right path. But I know I'm on the right path still, and I still mess up a lot. But I know where my end goal is. And the funny thing is, I used to worry about dying and not, like, sound morbid or weird. Mm -hmm. I don't kind of look forward to dying actually i mean i don't want to leave my leave right. my my family and my friends here don't get me wrong because my friends are my family is archery mm-hmm. and when i came back to the sport um which is another podcast it, that was that was a life changer for me yeah, to absolutely. realize that i had value where i didn't think i had value before the only value i thought i had might be through god and it actually in reality it's where your only value is mm-hmm. so that was really a, tr- a trigger mechanism for me mm-hmm. um that i was like wow yeah i can shoot by faith yeah. Because yeah. that's how I've always shot. Everybody does. Yeah. And so tell me, like, um, enough about me, for sure. Uh, tell me about, like, for you at the level you're shooting at now, one of the things that people would notice when they walk up on the line is you're probably, I'm pretty sure it's the only boat. Maybe there's one or two out there I haven't seen. But you've got Philippians, something written on there. Like I said, mm-hmm. I'm bad at this. But you've got several messages on there. So faith has to, I believe, or does, or you wouldn't write it on your boat to look at because it's on the backside of your eyes every time. You see that on there. So how do, how does faith relate to how well you shoot? 
And then how do you handle it if you don't shoot well? Like, we're both sitting here talking mm-hmm. in a podcast when we should be shooting in the shoot house. Right, exactly. So how do you handle that? What, is, well, what does that work like? The, the, the Bible describes faith as, faith is the sub- substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So faith truly is substance and evidence. Um, you know, everything we do, what, whether you believe it or not, is, is done by faith. You know, you, you, do, you, you go to a job in, in the, the hopes of, not, not just the hopes, but you go to a job expecting a paycheck. And so you work that job, you don't get paid every hour, you get paid at the end of the week or end of two week cycle. So, you're, so that, that paycheck is, is not seen, but it's substance and it's evidence. And when we're talking about archery, you know, when, when we pull back that bow and, and you're aiming, you know, you, you're believing that you're gonna hit your mark, that you're gonna shoot that and you're gonna hit your mark. And so it takes, uh, uh, it, t- it takes a level of faith to even come here to Vegas and to shoot and pay the money and shoot those arrows because you're you're believing for a a paycheck at the end of the day. You're believing that I'm going to be in the shoot off and I'm going to even if it doesn't, you know. But I have scriptures in the back of my bow. One's Philippians four thirteen, which says that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And so when I, when I look at that, when I see the Philippians 4.13 on the back of my bow, written in silver on a black bow, uh, it reminds me that I can do all things through him, through Christ. And so it gets my, gets my head, instead of saying, okay, don't miss, you know, don't miss, don't mess up. No, no, I can do all things. And, and we do miss. Right. You know, I missed, I dropped three this, this tournament. And... You know, and and it's not my desired end. My desired end was to be shooting right now in, mm-hmm. in the shoot offs. That's what I was believing for. That's why I came out. That was the su- if I didn't believe that I couldn't couldn't be in the shoot off, I wouldn't. I really wouldn't have come out. But that's why people come. And so, what when I miss? Hey, you know what? Listen, a score does not make me. A score does not make you. That's right. not that's not your value. You know, as we, we talked about, your value is in Christ. That he is number one. That that's your value. You know, if, if I drop a point and boy, I get all mad and I throw something and I cuss somebody out and things like that, you know, that, that, that doesn't do anything. That doesn't do anything for me, doesn't do anything for people around me, doesn't do anything. Because people want to see how are you not only in, in winning, but how are you at losing? Right. How are you when things don't go right? And, you know, the first day when I dropped my, my first point, I, and I was bummed because that wasn't what I wanted to happen. But I know that my value in Christ isn't just to shoot well, but it's to administer love and it's to minister grace. It's to, it's to, it's to, it's minister to people who, you know, Dropping a point at Vegas is is probably on the on the scale of of traumatic, very low. There's people out there they're they're suffering with cancer. There's people out there who are going through divorces. There are people out there that are going through some very very difficult things. And for me to kind of throw a hissy fit because I, I lost a point, you know, does not represent Christ. Especially as you mentioned, he went to the cross. You know, he. They they whipped his back thirty nine times with a what, what they called a cat of nine tails, which was a, a nine strand wha- uh, whip with rocks and and pieces of steel uh, to to the on the on the ends of it. So when they they would whip him, it would rip skin out of him. They they sh- they shoved a a crown of thorns on his head. They made him carry his cross, and so. He bled and he was nailed to that cross. So me dropping a point at Vegas and you, that's low, low, low on, on the whole scale of, of what's going on. But faith is, what, what, again, it's substance and it's evidence. And so, and so when, when we're shooting our bows, you know, we're having faith that, hey, listen, I, I'm going to do this to the best of my ability. And along the way... <laughs> I want to touch people's lives, and and there's another thing, and you you had mentioned it about uh, uh, 
doing what your coach asked you to do. You know, you just took, you said, okay, coach, I'll do what you told me, even though it doesn't make sense to me. <laughs> I'll do it because I have faith in you and I have faith in the process. And in the same way, a lot of people say, well, faith is just a crutch. It's just, it's just a crutch and people, you know, being a Christian is, is you know, because you, you can't handle it yourself. And, and it's not that way. It's, it's, it's not that way at all because faith is, some, faith is the most powerful thing on the face of this earth. And when you apply that faith into, into a God that loves you and cares about you, it, it's, it's, a, it's a powerful thing. You know, um, another thing is, is that we talk about in archery, the archery world, forgiveness. You know how you, you'll make a shot and that, sh that should not have went into the X, but it does. Right. And you talked about a little bit about how you know, we, we all make mistakes and we all make mistakes. We really do. But there's a something called grace, the grace of God. And it so relates to archery that it's 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 sort of it's sort of crazy how all these things kind of mesh together. But but grace is, is unmerited, undeserved favor. You know, we we've all been on the line and you you made a bad shot. I mean, it looked like that pin was in the red when it went off and you go down there and that's a solid 10 and you're going, how did that <laughs> happen? Like, Oh, and you know, and, and it make, it would make the, the worst person in the world religious because Oh, thank you God. <laughs> thank you God that I didn't drop that 10. But grace is just unmerited favor. And what, what God's, how he views us is he wants everybody to succeed. He wants everybody to come to know him. He wants to forgive everybody that's why jesus went to the cross not just so that the select christians or select people could be forgiven that for that forgiveness is out there it's there for the taking whether you take it or not is up to you but that forgiveness it, it isn't held and just meted out to people who well you know you look like you need forgiveness i'll give it to you no that forgiveness is there jesus died once and for all right. once and for all and so when I, when I look at archery and when I look at, uh, at the things of the Bible and what, what God has done, oh, you see some crazy parallels there. And, and you know, because a lot of times we, we, we've shot worse than what our score indicated. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we don't deserve forgiveness. We don't deserve anything. But through God's grace, because you're a son, he looks at you and, and he's cheering you on and he, and he sees you make mistakes and, he, and he, he isn't up there with a big old Louisville slugger baseball bat ready to bash you over the head because you made a mistake. He's willing and ready to come and take you by the hand and say, come on, let's get back up and let's do this again. One of the greatest stories in the Bible is, uh, is the, 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 the parable or the, the story of the, the prodigal son. How the prodigal son had everything. He was, uh, he lived with his father, lived with his brothers, and uh, had anything he needed. Decided that he wanted to take his 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 inheritance early, and so he took his inheritance and he went out and probably went to Las Vegas. Okay, <laughs> and they said he spent it all on on wild living, and he spent it on prostitutes, and he and he blew every dollar he had. And he ended up working for a, a pig farmer. And he was feeding the pigs uh, the, the pods of grain. It was the leftovers from the grain that they had harvested. And as he's feeding these pigs, he's so hungry, he's, he's looking at the pods that he's feeding the pigs going, boy, I, I think I, I want to get a handful of these and eat them because I'm starving. And the Bible says, and he came to himself he came to himself and he thought, wait a minute, I'm starving. I'm starving. I'm working with pigs and, and, and desiring what these pigs are eating while my father has servants who are being well fed. So he says, here's what I'm going to do. I'll go back to my father and I'll say, Father, forgive me, but if you'll take me back, 
I'll be your servant. I'll be your slave. Is that that's what he was saying? I'll be your slave, and I'll serve you as long as you I can get something to eat. <laughs> and the Bible says that as the son was coming back, the father saw the son from a long way off, and he recognized him because he knew how he walked. He recognized him, and the father, with joy, ran and met him and hugged him and took his his uh, his coat off and wrapped it around him now understanding this in, in, in the culture uh, to 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 a jewish family pigs and swine are unclean that's 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 right. taboo you don't you don't mess with pigs you don't raise pigs you don't touch them you don't go around them but if you've ever followed a pig truck you know how bad it smells. Or you drive through Iowa. If you drive through Iowa, <laughs> <laughs> you'll smell some pigs. Well, you just don't, you know, wash that stench out. So the father, his father, smelled the unclean pigs on his son, knew what he had done, knew where he was at, knew what he was doing, but still took his coat off and put it on him. So that that son who was wretched and miserable and stinky now looked just like his father because he had a new garment on him. <laughs> and, and the son goes, Father, I'm so sorry. Well, take me back as a servant. And he says, stop. He says, You're my son. Even though you, you spent all your money, you went out with prostitutes, you went to Vegas and you spent, you gambled <laughs> away everything, you smell like pigs. You're still my son. And he ordered the fatted calf to be, uh, to be killed. And they had a great feast and a great celebration now that his son has returned. See, that's grace. That's the grace of God. It's undeserved. Now, his older brother, the Bible says, looked and said, Hmm, you never threw a party for me. I've worked for you and I've never did done anything wrong and you've never thrown a party for me. And, and his father said this. He, goes, he, he said this to the older brother. He said, son, everything I have is yours. He said, all you had to do, if you wanted a party, go have a party. And so... The grace of God is, 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 and this is such a great story because the grace of God shows that even when we're in the pigsty, he's, he still loves us. He doesn't want us to stay there. He wants us to come out of there. He wants to put his garments on us, but he still loves us. And even when we're, we're, we, we haven't gone to the pigsty and we're sitting there going, I've, I've been a good boy, sometimes what, what we haven't done is taking advantage and saying, okay, God, so everything you have is mine, given to me. Man, I, wow. So I have grace and I have forgiveness and I have all this kind of stuff. And so so when, when, we're, when we're trying to parallel the, the, these things, you know, faith is, faith is the most powerful thing because it puts you in touch with these truths about grace. And... You know, it's like when we go back to archery, when you get a step up to the line, you know, if, if you step up to the line going, oh, and I hear this all the time from, especially the, the young kids. Well, I wonder how I'm going to shoot today. I probably miss. I'll probably, you know, I probably won't even hit the target. And they, and they're telling themselves all this negative, nasty stuff. I heard it on the pro line like three times a yeah. day. <laughs> and it's no wonder they miss. <laughs> Because you've just told yourself, this is what I want. Well, it's probably going to happen. But faith believes the best. And if, if something worse happens, if, if you miss and you, know, you, you shoot a bad shot, well, well, guess what? Life goes on. I heard a friend of mine say, he goes, listen, when it comes to archery, he goes, we're not saving lives. We're just shooting arrows. <laughs> you know, we're not saving lives. We're shooting arrows. And truly, that's what we're doing. And so uh, I, I know I explained, I talked about a lot of stuff, but faith is so very important because it sets you, it's, it's not, and it's not just positive confession. It's not just, you know, if I say the right thing a hundred times in a row, I'll, I'll get that. 
you know there, there's more right. there's more to that th- than than what it is but faith is is you know believing in yourself believing in your equipment um you know i i know if, if i have equipment my if my equipment's off my faith level goes down <laughs> because my right. equipment level's off but i know when my equipment level's on and i'm feeling good and things are working boy i tell you what it's just it, it becomes almost automatic shooting x's just becomes automatic just like what Stephen Hansen was doing this morning. <laughs> hey, that's another story. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> and I'll tell you what, even even from a hunting perspective, I can't tell you how many times well I've said it to myself. Um, and then when you know, when I gave my life my life to Christ, I hadn't been in the mountains since then. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, uh, two years ago I went and um, you know, it harvested and I was fortunate, got it back in the bulls again. But um, last year I was standing in a snowstorm, um, to get an opportunity at a bull that I actually went up and I slept in two inches of slush mm-hmm. in a Gore-Tex bivy, which, you know, thank gosh, like it's, it's hard to imagine you can sleep in stuff like that with any kind of anything, any kind of product. I don't care what it is. just amazing that you can survive overnight in that. Right. But that's what I had to do to be in front of that bull in the morning. And then it snow would come and it would go. And it was just, it was pretty incredible. But I used to sit there and think when I saw, you know, I killed a couple 200 inchers. I've got like nine booners and I don't know, 50 or 60 Pope and Youngs. Been very fortunate. And, and I, I can remember sometimes those deer walking at me and be like, God, please let this deer come to me. Please, let, please, God, just please give me a shot. And it's so funny because when you become a Christian, you, you, you that changes. Mm-hmm. I don't think that anymore at all. Like, I, I spent a better part of, a, well, a month and... A week last year, mm-hmm. getting an opportunity at a bull, and working my tail off for that. And I remember, I shot shot the bull I was after, didn't find him. Mm. Um, and so I, I remember, like one of the days when I was looking, it took me three days I had before I had to get back to my kiddos. And so um, I remember going through my pack, and this is really like, never really clicked with me with hunting until now. Mm-hmm. Because I'm on a mountain by myself. I hunt by myself almost all the time. Mm-hmm. Almost all the time. In I'm in grizzly country. I'm at 9,000, 10,000 feet. People think I'm crazy. <laughs> For me, I'm not scared of death anymore. Mm-hmm. And I, I very much so respect the fact that a grizzly can just, like, oh, like ruin you. And I'm just yeah. gonna, I could die. I easily. Mean, easily. Like, and pepper spray, that's just seasoning. <laughs> you spray on them, like, on yourself before they ruin you. Ask the guy last year who sprayed up bear who came back and ruined him again on his way out so um you are completely vulnerable Mm -hmm. there that is the one place on earth you can say what you want other than maybe walking down through downtown brooklyn or something in the middle of the night and you know there's no police officers there because they're helping to round up all the protesters with crayons and cardboards who are protesting immigrants coming in on a Mm-hmm. Airplane. It had just happened last week. I had to throw it in there. That's another story. <laughs> <laughs> but there's no cops there. You've been to walk through a really rough neighborhood. You could say, well, that's that's spooky and scary taking your life in your own hands. But going on the mountain, nobody really knows where I'm at. I mean, they have a rough idea. A couple mm-hmm. people do. But, you know, I I you know, I know, didn't carry a sat phone this year. I generally don't carry a sat phone, but I should. Um, and, man, it could just be over in a second. And so I hit this bull. And, and, and halfway through that process of looking for him, on day two, I'm scouring every nook and cranny that I can, mm-hmm. every one of them. And I remember opening my pack, and in my pack I had my monthly child support cash was in there. And um, I had a little bit of extra cash to get me back home with, because i not like I walk out there with, you know, a bunch of credit cards I can go swipe in hotel rooms. I'm, I'm in my truck, or which was rare. I was usually on the mountain. I'd be out eight, nine days in a row stretch. And I'm up there believing 100% in the clothes that I have on are yeah. going to keep me alive. And, and they do. And the shelters. Um, and so when you've got nothing but just a, it's a Kafara super tarp, it's called. It's mm-hmm. like just a, just a tarp. It literally is a tarp. No floor to it. Um, there's just, there, there's nothing to sustain life. And, and you're looking around and looking at this money in here. And I can see my, my camp, you know, it's about a mile away roughly probably. Um, several thousand feet down. And I'm looking at that money, I'm going, man, I, this has no purpose. Mm-hmm. Up there, it's not, nothing. Worth nothing. N- th- I, it, all this money I have on here, if I wanted to, there's no one I can pay this money to right now to find my bull. And mm-hmm. I wanted that bull like really bad. Yeah. 
And what else is it good for? I can start a fire with it, and if I run out of toilet paper, I can use it. <laughs> but that's it. Yeah. Like, that's it. And and I went to the mountains, and, and if you go back through the, the live feeds and things I did um, last year, you know, I, I was going there. I was looking for a giant bull, but I wasn't looking for a giant bull. You can hear that. The, the theme is the whole entire time because it was. I don't know what exactly I'm looking for, but I'm out here for looking for something else. And I never describe it because, honestly, didn't know what it was. Mm-hmm. I found it that second day while I was looking for that bull. It was, like perspective Mm -hmm. and that's as close i think personally that i can get to god is up there on a mountain so because there i'm completely reliant on him honestly Mm -hmm. and there's a lightning storm thunderstorm i mean dude lightning and thunderstorms at ten thousand feet are not like i feel pretty tough anymore like (laughs) i don't know like it'll make you feel like a little girl pretty quick oh yeah because there's nowhere to go where are you gonna go it took you three hours to get down to to you know a, a decent elevation and then you're in a bunch of trees and there's like i remember looking at my binoculars going well there's trees down there i got struck by lightning too so trees up here i don't know so just hang out here mm-hmm. <laughs> you're just totally just hoping you don't get hit by lightning that's what you are yeah. and uh you know and all that you're, you're after a quest for an animal and it's just it puts everything like in complete perspective so anyways what i was getting at was um i don't I don't say that anymore in my head, like, oh, God, please just give me a shot at this bull, or, oh, God, please get me out of this situation. Mm -hmm. I just am where I am now. I'm, like, really comfortable in that. And, like, if I was in a life-threatening situation, I don't know I'm here and there. Mm -hmm. I'm surprised I made it this far, quite honestly, but I I, I just am where I am now. There's Mm -hmm. no major fear that happens to me anymore, and I think it's really because of that, because I know where I'm going to. Now, I don't want, like I said, I don't want to miss my family and my kids and my archer community and my family, but... That's the way it is. And so to relate all this back to shooting again, there is a faith component to mm-hmm. it. But there's also, I think, some people will get upset if they put their faith in into God with the results that they have in the timber, on a mountain, or at the target. And so mm-hmm. how do you, how do you, what do you say to somebody when, I don't need God, he doesn't care. Because in reality, like, I mean, my response generally is, I don't know if you know this or not, but there's a lot of other people hunting on the mountain, too, that are also praying <clears> for the same bull. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and there's a lot of people in line, what, like 280 people in my division that, our division, right, and the pro division that are sitting there going, please, God, just keep me clean for this. <laughs> well, <laughs> a lot of prayers went well, up this wait, weekend. Like, how is it fair that he helps Nathan Brooks and not me? That's not fair. <laughs> like, he can't help all of us. Yeah. So um, what do you say to somebody who's just, you know, I really, I tried it because that's, it happened to me. You know, I just like, I tried the marriage. I did it the way I was supposed to do it mm-hmm. as best I could. I, you know, and it, and it failed almost instantly. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, and I hate God again, but I always believed in God though at that right. point. So right. it was a little bit different. And so it didn't take me as long to get back on track. Like I said, still make mistakes daily. But, um, so what do you say to somebody who just says, Hey, I don't, yeah. God, well, I don't care. You know, the, the response that I have to that is, you know, I never argue with people. I never want to uh, get into an argument with somebody saying, well, you know, this is the reason. These are the things, you know, what, what I understand is this. Even if you reject God, he still loves you and he still is reaching out to you. That the, that the, the offer of grace and the offer of salvation, the offer, offer of forgiveness is still there. It's never taken off the table. And a lot of people, you know, it, it, for, for instance, if, if you got to a place in your life where you're like, well, God, forget about you, I don't need you, and he struck you dead, you wouldn't be here right now talking about his grace, talking about how he has changed your life. And, and, but, that, but God's a good father. Like I said before, he, he isn't up there with a baseball bat, you know, looking to, to hurt you. Right. The, the, the grace and the love of God, as a matter of fact, the Bible says that we love him because he first loved us. He first loved us. We, we didn't go seek him. He came and sought us. Um, you know, it, and the Bible says that the goodness of God leads us to repentance. You know, I, I've, I've heard and probably everybody here has heard, as, as a matter of fact, uh, there was a funny, uh, funny video that Adam Gibson, uh, Pro Archer, shared right. with me. And... Uh, and uh, I, I kind of replied to him on Facebook that when I saw him, I was I was going to punch him. You know? <laughs> and so that became kind of a joke between us about about, about repenting. Um, you know, God is a good father, and and many of us, many people, did not have good fathers. You know, and and your, your the, the image that, and I know you have a good father, 
Um, but the image that a lot of people have from their dad is either he either, you know, did this or did that or whatever like that. And so we, we kind of cast that onto, well, God must be the same way. And even, you know, I know that they've resisted, people have resisted God. I don't need you. I don't need you. I don't need you. But there comes that time, just like what happened with you, that, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm out of options here. What do I do? And God's saying, I'm here. I'm here for you. You know, God isn't, God isn't offended. You know, I hear people, oh, God's offended by this. God, God doesn't get offended. He's not offended that, that he was your last option. Right. Not offended. You know, you know, it's, I hear people, you know, it's funny. I hear people cuss sometimes. They'll go, oh, you're a preacher. I'm sorry. I said, I don't have to defend him. <laughs> He's heard it all too, you know. Right. And, uh, and so what, 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 I, what I tell people, what I would encourage people to do is that, listen, you know, resist him all you want. But his love for you does not change. That in those times when you know that you need that you need something more because you know here, here's what we understand and you've mentioned mentioned this to me you know you could shoot a 200 hundred inch buck and it will give you a a a, a an, an something like yes i did this you know you could win vegas and win the money and get on the the billboards of but, but all that stuff, all that recognition and, and the money and the fame is only going to take you so far. Right. Because as soon as you're a crowned Vegas champ, that's the past. Yep. As soon as you killed that 200-inch buck, that's the past. Now what do I have? Now who am I? Now am I, am, I, am I just made up of killing bucks? Am I made up just shooting bows and shooting archery? It, life has to be more than that. And so when it comes down to it, uh, and, and I speak about this at funerals, you know, nobody has ever ha, has ever laid on their deathbed saying, I wish I would have spent more time in the office. <laughs> and uh, and the Bible says that our, our life is like a vapor. Um, it's like a it's like a waft of steam. It's here today and it's gone just like that. And so knowing that I, that, that sometimes people, they're, they're just angry, they're upset, they have a false perception of God, they have a false perception of who God is, and uh, and they may resist him, but but he's not up there, you know. Uh, th that's why I, I tell people at our church all the time, I say, hey, listen, I said, you realize that if, if some of you were God, you would have nuked a lot of countries a long time ago. <laughs> you would have blown up people groups. You would have blown up this person, this person. I said, but what you don't know in some of these countries that are causing us the most trouble, there are, there are, there's a Christian community that's, that's doubling it and gaining ground. And, and they love God right in the middle of some terrorist hotspots <laughs> that, that, you know, you could look and say, well, they're all this or they're all that. They're all terrorists or something like that. But there are believers, fellow Christians that will be in heaven with me and you in those communities. So, so you can't ever limit the love of God. You can't ever limit his reach. That if he could reach inside a closed country that proclaims itself to be Muslim, that's closed off and they're 100% Muslim, and still there's a Christian community that's growing if he could reach in there and touch them, he could reach you. He could reach you. And, and, and the Bible says in Revelation, he says, he behold, he says, I knock on the door. He says, I'm, not, I'm knocking at the door of your hearts. And he said, if you open the door to me, he goes, I'll come in and eat with you. Or the Bible says, King James says, sup with you. I'll come in and eat with you. See, a lot of people... They, 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 they look at church and he, here's what they say. They say, oh, the, the walls are going to fall in or the ceiling is going to fall down if I ever come to church because they have a perception and, and, and maybe it's partially true because this is what the church has done that when you come into church, well, we're going to find everything wrong with you. Well, what do you, oh, well, you shouldn't <laughs> do that or you shouldn't do this. So when you walk back out of church, you're not feeling uplifted. You're feeling defeated. Right. You know, be like, well, Rod, you know, your form is a little bit off. 
you know, you shot that nine, that nine was kind of, you know, you, you probably, you know, you, your bow's a little bit out of tune and your arrow shouldn't be this way. And, and if I, if, if that's how I coached, you wouldn't learn. All you'd right. learn is what was wrong with your set of what's wrong with you. Right. But, but what God does is, is I want to find, you know, yeah, there's stuff wrong. But if I find the good, if I find the diamonds, if I if I talk about how good you can be, the bad stuff falls off. Right. You see, well, one of the greatest things to to learn, it's like if you have bad form, I te- well, what do we do? Talk about the bad form. No, we, te- we teach you how to use good form. Right. Well, stand up straighter. That's when, when I was yeah. younger, when I was uh, in my late 20s and uh, maybe early 30s. No, I was in my early 30s. And I remember uh, I was shooting on the line and I had a, a, a pro line bow and shooting, you know, 20 yards and I had my trigger and I'm, you know, yeah. slap that trigger. And I'm, I'm stacking arrows in, inside the tent, just stacking them right in there. And Cloyd Brown, he looks over at me, he goes, hey, Randy. I said, what? He goes, uh, you're shooting that bow wrong. And I looked at him, and I said, I, do, you, do, you see, do, you see, do you see the arrows I have stacked down there? And, and my, that's, what, that, that's what my mind wanted to do. How am I shooting this bow wrong? You see the results. Right. And he, and he, and I and I knew enough to shut up <laughs> and to say, okay, what am I doing wrong? And he goes, for you're moving your feet around way too much. He goes, you goes, plant those feet. And he taught me how you know, to put one foot uh, out to kind of angle in. And he taught me how to hold the bow and hook up the release and draw back and breathe. And 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 once he taught me that. Once he gave me those 10 steps to work on, all that bad form stuff went away because he gave me something to replace it. Right. And, and, and see, a lot of people think, man, when I go to church, man, all the preacher's going to do is just you know, talk about sin. You're going to talk about this. You're going to talk about that. But, but, but what God wants to give you in Jesus is something to replace all that bad stuff so that... That, that stuff goes away. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that, that in Christ, that, that we are free, that, that we are no longer slaves to sin. It says, it says you, know, you are no longer a slave to sin when Christ comes in. So you could sit there, well, you know, I've got this wrong with me and that wrong with me and that wrong with me. When Christ comes in, he goes, I'm replacing that garbage. I'm replacing that stuff. And, and it's, it's like, well, d- does it all go away? Well, if you wanted to. Right. If you wanted to. It, it, you could, okay, God, I'm replacing, I'll, I'll replace my, my thoughts with your word. I'll replace my love with your love. I'll replace my words with your words. And it, and it takes that discipline to do. And that's what you had to do with your coach. That's what I had to do with Cloyd Brown and go, okay, I'll replace my habits with your habits. And that's what it became. And so to, to the person who's sitting here and listening and saying, you know, I just don't believe in God. I, 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 I don't have time for that. And you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just want to do what, what I want to do. You know, my, my advice is, is God loves you. He loves you. He knows what you've done. He knows what you think, but he still loves you. And he cares about you. He cared about you enough to send his son to die for you. That, that offer is still on the table. You might say, well, you know, uh, uh, w- what happens if I'm on my deathbed? He'll still take you. But see, but that's not the life that he wants you to live. Right. He doesn't want you to live that fire, that, that, the, the, the fire alarm life where, oh my goodness, I'm just about to die. Now I need God. You know, he wants to give you life and life more abundantly. And you could live that life right now through Christ. And so. Awesome. <laughs> There's not much you can say after you say a lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, you know, he, he, but 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 here's the thing, and and he, he, you know, our lives aren't lived for our, ourselves, right? You know, um, we, we want to become. I I want to become part of people's stories when 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 they talk about their history when they talk about 
their lives. You know, I want to become a part of their story in a positive way. That when they remember me, when they remember how I minister to them, or if I shot with them on the line, and you know, and 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 God has used me to to counsel people and, and to do weddings and do funerals and of the archery community, and and it's just growing in in that way. But not so that they remember me, so I could feel good about myself, but that I left a deposit, I left an impact on somebody's life. That when they think, you know, uh, about a bad experience at church, they can say, you know, but but I know that Randy is a Christian and he's a pastor, but he's not like that. He showed me love and he showed me grace and he showed me for forgiveness. And, you know, our story goes back that we're both written on, you know, you're written on my history. I'm written on your history. It, it's, it, it's, it's an amazing thing. It's an awesome thing. It's a great thing. And because that's how God wants us to, to minister. You know, I don't go to these archery shoots and, and get up on a platform and start preaching to people. Right. I don't get up there and hit the, the gavel on the thing and, hey, let's not be, oh, you're, you're, turn or burn, repent, you evil, <laughs> nasty right. sinners, you know. Um, I, I don't do that. I, 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 I try to do what Jesus did. He went around, he did good. And he showed people love, and he showed people grace, and he showed people forgiveness. One of one of my absolute favorite stories uh, it was that uh, the group of religious leaders uh, caught a woman, and she was uh, caught in the very act of adultery. And they threw her down in front of Jesus, and they said, "Our law says that she should be stoned to death." And, you know, being stoned to death was they, they picked up rocks and threw those rocks at the person until they died. It was brutal. And Jesus acted as if he didn't even hear what they said. And he scribbled in the sand, wrote in the dirt a little bit as he sat there. And they kind of said, didn't you hear what we had to say? And Jesus looks up. And he looks at the Pharisees and he looks at the religious, religious leaders and he says, He who is without sin cast the first stone. And he said, one by one from the oldest to the youngest, they dropped their rocks and they walked away. And when there was nobody around, Jesus looked at the woman and he said, Is there anybody here who's condemning you? And she said, No one. And he goes, and neither do I condemn you. He goes, but go and sin no more. And I, sometimes I look and, and and if that happened in our churches. Knowing full well she was going to again probably. If that <laughs> happened in our churches at, at some time. But we would have, uh, we would, well, but did you, well, you just can't, you just, Jesus, you just can't do that. You just can't let her go like that. You, you've got to, you've got to counsel her. You got to do something with her. But, but, but Jesus knew enough that he saw a person who needed forgiveness, who needed grace. He saw a person that was so broken inside that he saw through the act, he saw through all those other things. And he saw somebody who needed him and needed right. his forgiveness and his love and his grace bestowed. Now, I, I would like to believe that she got up and she started following him and never did that again. But even if that's not the case, Jesus still forgave her. Yep. And so that's the kind of God we serve. That's the kind of God we serve. That, that, that forgiveness is there, not so that you go out and do more forget, more junk, but that forgiveness is there that you can receive it and say, God, there's a better way. I'm going to replace my bad habits with these new things about what, what God has done, and that's going to take over, and that's going to guide my life. And so... And I would say that um, if you are a Christian, you're watching this and listening, or you've given yourself to Christ, believe, mm -hmm. I would say that that's exactly how, for you, that's how you're going to have to look at archery and a coach for you, whether you know, that's me helping you or mm -hmm. whoever it might yeah. 
is you have to have faith in that. And and they probably are going to, a good coach is going to look at you in the same way because I can't tell you how many people I try to help and I shake my head because mm-hmm. I, I, I that's why I don't give like hourly lessons very often. If I do, it's very expensive and it's only because I can only give you so much information to help you. Mm-hmm. And then people walk away and then it's it's up to you to take and, and run with that. Right that football that I've given you basically, you know, it's up to you to take those arrows mm-hmm. I've given you now and put them in the middle of the target. You have everything you need and, um, and, and not to compare anyone on this earth with God, but that's the same kind of relationship. Really, honestly, a good coach has with a student. And there were times when I promise you, Tim knows, I'm sure I was cussing him like you have no <laughs> idea. And if you don't, sorry, Tim, <laughs> I did a lot. Um, I just, you're wrong. You're wrong. And I'm going to do it my way. Mm-hmm. And, it, and it happens to me now, like where people like get upset at something they see that I show out there in slow motion video or something. I, I just, you just saw it. I didn't do that. Like mm-hmm. that arrow made an S curve coming out of the bow because <laughs> the cams were not doing what they're supposed to do. There's no other reason, no other explanation for that. And then immediately there's defensive walls that go up from mm-hmm. a ton of shooters. And I, I just shake my head and just say, all right. But you know what's funny is like in a, in a couple of weeks, they'll be back asking questions about that again. Today, a guy asked me about that, and we were, we're driving by because I released a little, quick little uh, uh, frame by frame shot mm-hmm. of an arrow making an S curve coming out of the bow and explaining what cam. And he's like, "Man, is that is that happening now with the Hoyts?" <laughs> Thankfully, no, it's not. Mm-hmm. But it was with that model. And so, when people come back at you and 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 be upset because you've told them something they don't want to hear. Mm-hmm. God does that to you, and you have to have that faith. So if you're a Christian, you understand that you need to have that faith in mm-hmm. those who are teaching you. And sometimes there are people who will teach you wrong, and you're better off having faith in them in the wrong system than the right system. Believe it or not, hmm. I've seen I've seen guys do that where they've shot. I mean, if Rio Wild was to coach you, I I don't even know what to say. Like, I would not look at Rio and be like, hey, that's how you should shoot a bow. Like, great get, form. Yeah. He has <laughs> but it works. some really bad takeoffs and some really good landings. I don't know. But I will know exactly. But it yeah. works. And he shoots a lot of arrows to get to that level. Yeah. I'm sure he'd tell you the same thing. Um, and, and then you look at a guy like Jesse Broadwater, who's a classic perfection Perfect in form. his form. Classic. Perfect. You know. Um, they're both winning tournaments. They both yeah. have heads all the time. And, you know, geez. They both get the same results. So, but I'll bet they have the faith in that system. And sometimes that faith without a coach is built by um, confidence winning over and over again or shooting big deer over and over again and over and over again. And uh, it's whether you're a hunter or whether you're a bow hunter. And if you're a believer, you understand where I'm coming from with all that. And if you're not a believer, that's okay. Hopefully you grasp this concept. And then maybe one day... God will work in your life in a really cool way like you worked in mine because for me you could preach to me all you want all that's going to make me want to do is run faster away from you but um, you know when I ran out of everything is when I had to and that happens with archery Right. when I'm completely broken to the point like I can't I give up I can't hit the middle of the target anymore I don't know what's going on I have target panic (laughs) I hate even saying that I've never had target panic so knock on wood I, I don't ever want it but you know I hear the word and that's like cussing really bad to me <laughs> like i don't want to shh yeah. <laughs> but um uh it to, to get through those kind of things you're gonna have to fa- have faith in something right or you're just gonna keep shooting arrows all over the place yeah. and not making not your pin probably won't even get to the target anymore and eventually you completely fall apart and you walk away from the sport which is sad mm-hmm. so um hopefully a lot of people can relate what we've talked about with god now and and how he basically he's your coach in life mm-hmm um, and no, he doesn't, to me, I, I understand he could speak to you. I haven't like her. I'm like, Hey Rod, what's up? Like that doesn't happen to me. <laughs> right. Um, but it, it, it does it. I, I go back sometimes and listen to my Bible. Even at the times when the days when you think that I probably are the furthest from my Bible are probably the days, the nights that I've got my earbuds in and I'm listening to certain specific things I'm looking for in the Bible. Right. And, um, that happens with archery. So to end the story, um, thank you for having me on the podcast, having coming on the podcast. Thank you for having me. And, um, it was a pretty cool talk. We never know really where we're going to with these podcasts. We kind of have an idea and this one went whew, way off. I don't know how long we've been on here, but it's been a while and I know you got to catch a plane. So 
It's been a lot of fun. In airport. Thanks a lot, Randy. Appreciate it. Love you, brother. Love you too, man. We'll catch you guys later. Peace out. Bye-bye. Nailed it! <laughs> <laughs>